Okay, hello everyone. I'm Vincent Racaniello. I'm in the Department of Microbiology and Immunology here where we have been doing virology since 1982. We've worked on a number of viruses and then in the last few months, like many other people, we've started to work on SARS-CoV-2 and I want to tell you about two projects that we've started. One, a clinical project looking at COVID-19 patients and a basic science project uh, looking at some viral proteins. As you've heard before in this meeting, SARS-CoV-2 is primarily a respiratory pathogen. This is clearly a bat virus. You might have heard Raul Rabadon talking about that earlier. Bats constitute 20% of all mammalian species. So I'm not sure about this idea of treating bats with antivirals. Bats harbor more viruses than any other organism on the planet. And the curious part is that bats do not get sick from them. And SARS-related coronaviruses infect the intestinal tract of bats. It's shed in the guano. And so it has changed somewhat to infect humans. We know in, in many individuals, the virus enters the respiratory tract where it replicates in the respiratory epithelium and can move all the way down into the alveoli, as you have heard and cause respiratory disease. But what is uh, becoming clear is that the virus can also infect the GI tract. The gut epithelium has receptors for the virus ACE2, uh, and there's evidence that this is happening in people. So we, the virus has not lost some of its intestinal tropism in spillover to humans. So let me tell you first about the uh, clinical related project that we're interested in. This is looking at fecal shedding of the virus. And here are two papers that have previously reported fecal shedding. Here is one in, in uh, pediatric patients, persistent fecal viral shedding. And a number of these patients also have gastrointestinal symptoms, including diarrhea and loose stool. Most of these studies uh, look at fecal shedding by RT-PCR. And we don't really know how many patients shed virus. A number of groups have found infectious virus. So even though mostly we're looking by RT-PCR, you can find virus in the stool. And we don't know what the role of fecal shedding and transmission is. However, we do know that back in the outbreak of SARS-1 in 2003 in Hong Kong, there was an epidemic in an apartment building caused by faulty plumbing and aerosolizing feces and sewage, and that was clearly uh, a way of transmission. So we have very little information on the role of this in the current outbreak. We don't know the role in pathogenesis, whether, for example, it's secondary to lung infection or can be separate, separately infected. Many patients report initially a gastroenteritis before the lung infection. So in our first project, we'd look, like to look at this. We'd like to know if shedding occurs in asymptomatic patients. Uh, does it correlate temporally with shedding from the respiratory tract, or is it something completely independent? And what we're doing is obtaining samples from Daniel Griffin, who is an adjunct here, but also is chief of infectious disease at Pro Healthcare Hospitals. This is a, a medical network in the New York area of one and a half million patients and 3,000 doctors. So a very good source of samples. He'll inactivate them in the hospitals and send them to us where we'll assay uh, for the virus genome by RT-PCR. And in select cases when we have positives, uh, of course, we'd like to correlate that with nasopharyngeal shedding, but we'd also like to know if there's infectious virus present. So we'll attempt uh, virus isolation in cell culture which of course has to be done under BSL-3 containment. We'll do that with the N-Lipkin. The second project is a basic science project addressing the function of two viral proteins called NSP4 and ORF8. And I, I first got interested in ORF8 based on this paper published in 2018, which showed that uh, deletion of the, the, the gene encoding this protein reduces replication of SARS-1, classic SARS. In that outbreak in 2003, about halfway through the outbreak, it was noticed that this gene was deleted in the circulating strain. And for the remainder of the outbreak, this gene was missing. So here's where this gene lies. Here's a map of the 30,000 base genome. And all, all the way at the right are proteins produced by subgenomic mRNAs. 
And here in SARS-CoV is the ORF-8 open reading frame. So this was disrupted in circulation in SARS-1. It turns out to reduce the replication of the virus, probably reduces the pathogenesis and maybe uh, uh, lengthens survival time so that the virus is more easily transmitted. This, this open reading frame, by the way, is intact so far in SARS-CoV-2. And so we'd like to understand what this protein does uh, and its role in pathogenesis. Uh, as you've heard already, the virus enters the cell and uh, either fusion at the membrane or from within endosomes, the genome enters the cytosol. The first half of the genome is translated uh, into proteins. Sorry. And these proteins are involved in replication. They also induce the formation of double membrane vesicles, which are the sites for viral genome synthesis by the RNA polymerase of the virus. And NSP4, the other protein we're interested in, participates in the formation of these vesicles, which are derived from the ER, Golgi, late endosomes, autophagosomes, and lysosomes. And of course, that's where RNA synthesis occurs. ORF8 is interestingly located in the ER, and the two proteins interact with a similar, similar set of ER resident proteins. And so recently, Krogan at UCSF has done a uh, protein interactive map with all the SARS-CoV-2 proteins. And here is ORF8 on the left, and these are all the proteins that he found to interact with them. And you can see there are many proteins in this little sub-bubble here involved in the ERAD pathway which of course is ER-associated degradation pathway. And here's the interactome for NSP4, and you can see another, another subset of proteins shared with uh, ORF8 from the ERAD pathway. And this is all linked to virus replication in this paper, showing that the, the viruses uh, exploit ER-derived vesicles, including ERAD regulators, which are induced by infection, for their replication. So ER stress occurs during replication of this virus, and of course, uh, that's meant to clear the infection, but the virus actually utilizes some of those proteins for its replication machinery. And so what we'd like to do here, this is our second project in collaboration with uh, Rod Rothstein and Bob Reed, is to confirm this, these interactions that ORF8 and NSP4 interact with these ERAD proteins and other molecular chaperones in the ER in infected cells and then together with uh, Rod to use yeast to identify pathways that, that regulate lipid metabolism and vesicle trafficking. And uh, Rod will do this using a synthetic lethal approach where the individual proteins are put into yeast and overproduced. And then we look for lethality and in particular, uh, which, which genes uh, induce synthetic lethality. And so a nice way of complementing the, uh, so the studies we're gonna do in infected cells. And the last thing I want to tell you is one of our other activities. By the way, this, all, this work in my lab has been done with uh, Amy Rosenfeld, our collaborators, Rod Rothstein, Robert Reed, Daniel Griffin, and Ian Lipkin. And we have been, since 2008, recording conversations among virologists uh, in a podcast called This Week in Virology. And recent ones have been with faculty members here, Daniel Griffin, Ian Lipkin, and Steve Morse. And Mark Dennison is a Chief of Pediatric ID at Vanderbilt, who is really well-versed in antivirals. And he pointed out something that hasn't been mentioned all day today, which is that making antivirals against coronaviruses that target the RNA polymerase is difficult because the virus carries an error correction protein. And remdesivir is very special in that way and that it's not affected by that error correction. So if you're interested, check these out. And if you'd like to join us in a conversation, please let us know. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Vince. Um, if there are any questions, please uh, raise your hand. Andrea, this is Ira Tavis. I, I raised my hand. Um, Vince, um, I have a question. Um, you know, as you well know, ER stress can, can eventually lead to apoptotic pathways when it's uh, when it's chronic. And the question I have is, uh, after the virus, during its infection cycle, usurps the ER stress pathway and then replicates and leads the cell, does the cell then undergo 
uh, self death? And if so, could that involve a unrestrained ER stress response? So, so yes, cells do undergo apoptosis. It's always a race, right, between when virus gets out. The virus budding occurs over many hours. And so uh, the, the sooner the cell dies by apoptosis, that would cut that off. And so it's, it's very likely that viruses can delay the induction of apoptosis using specific antagonists, as you know. Vince, Sam Silverstein, um, do you, is there a survey or a study where we know which uh, viral proteins uh, humans make antibodies to? Do they make antibodies to all the viral proteins or only a subset? Well, that's a good question, Sam. One would assume that uh, antibodies are made to all of them because they're all, the particles are processed and presented. Uh, but mostly the, the antibodies against the spike like a protein have been studied because, of course, those are important for preventing infection. Eric, Sean? Um, hi, Vince. Uh, I noticed that uh, in the ERAD uh, protein interactome, you had a set of TIM proteins, which are the intermembrane space pro uh, chaperones in mitochondria. Uh, ERAD is associated with ER mitochondrial communication, but have you looked into that any further? It's also connected to the fact that the ER mitochondrial connector is again the in only internal lipid raft that we know of, mm. again, mm. rich in cholesterol. Yeah, no, that, that's an interesting observation. We haven't done anything with that yet, but a lot, a lot of those interactions are worth studying for sure. And I think there's a, I don't know the name, but it starts with E A N T. So maybe you can uh, ask a question. Uh, hello? Yeah. Yeah, okay, so uh, I wanted to ask if- I'm Sorry, could you introduce yourself? Um, Emmanuel Entrege, I'm a postdoc at, at Columbia. Okay. So I, I, I wanted to ask about how you make a mention about the virus having an error of correction protein. And as, as we know, there are coronavirus strains in the battle of like a 500 plus. Is it a possibility that- is it a, a possibility that all the uh, coronaviruses have uh, this kind of uh, mechanism, having an error or correction protein? Yes, they all do because the genome is so big, you know, 29,000 bases, that without it, they would suffer error extinction. So all of them have to have error correction to be that large. Oh, okay. Yeah, thanks. 